I'm Alex Tonk, and today I'll be talking about our project Trajectory Net, which blends continuous non-volume flows and dynamic optimal transport to solve problems in modeling the transcriptome over time. The problem we tackle in this paper is how to predict longitudinally from cross-sectional data. Cross-sectional data in this context is data given as samples from a population at a small number of discrete time points. These are representative samples from the population at each time, but we do not know the correspondence of individual points between time points. An example of this type of data might be survey or polling data. We do not poll the same individuals at each time, but receive a sample from the population. Here we focus on cells, where current technologies require destroying the cell to measure, preventing measuring the same cell at more than one time point. We're able to sample the population at some discrete time points, but individual cells do not correspond between time points. This data must be processed at a distribution level. One question we might want to ask is given an individual at a specific time, what is the likely trajectory? In other words, at a new time, what is its state? Another problem might be to infer the likely distribution over states at an unobserved time. We'll show how to solve these two tasks efficiently with trajectory net and apply this to single cell transcriptomic data. First, before we get into continuous normalizing flows, a little bit about stated normalizing flows. So normalizing flows transform a very simple distribution, often the standard Gaussian distribution, into a more useful one with an invertible neural network or a series of invertible transformations. The invertibility means that we can apply the change of variables formula to calculate the probability, or the log probability, of any point at time t1. This log probability can then be maximized according to the maximum likelihood principle. Generally, the most challenging part computationally is computing this log determinant. And it turns out to be more efficient if we compose a series of simpler invertible transformations. If we instead transpose a, a bunch of uh, simpler transformations, then this can be thought of as composing layers in a neural network. Uh, so here, to calculate the log probability, we just need to iterate backwards over the in-transformations and sum up the log determinants. As presented in Chen et al's paper in neural ODE, continuous modeling flows take the number of layers to the limit. Directly modeling the derivative of a flow and integrating this derivative using standard numerical methods for solving ordinary differential equations to solve for x at time t1. There are two useful side effects of taking the number of layers to the limit. The first is that the log determinant computation simplifies to a trace of the Jacobian, simplifying things trans computationally, although the integration time still dominates. The other useful side effect is that flows cannot cross in an ODE. This means they cannot model some relatively simple invertible transformations like f of x equals negative x, which is a problem in some applications, but we'll show how useful it is in modeling cells. Continuous modeling flows can be used to transport populations a long time, but may produce implausible or circuitous paths. The only thing they do is optimize the second time point, so they make sure that the end point of the path matches the end, and the beginning time point matches the beginning. There is no constraint on the middle, or which pairings of cells are made. Next we show how to adapt the continuous modeling flows uh, to the use through regulation of paths. Penalizing the squared L2 norm of the derivatives can be thought of penalizing the path length. This tends to straighten paths and has a nice interpretation in terms of optimal transport, which we get into next. Uh, optimal transport studies how to move mass with minimal plots. So for example, we have some pile of dirt represented by distribution mu at time t0, and we want this dirt to be piled according to distribution nu at time 1. This is traditionally solved as a linear program to determine the mapping between points at time 0 and time 1. However, this can also be interpreted in terms of dynamic optimal transport, which models the full path of particles over time and matches the distribution at the beginning of end time points. Uh, then the expected distance of a particle as it moves is equivalent to the Wasserstein distance. Connecting this to normalizing flows with a squared L2 penalty over the function, the difference is that the probability at time 1 is not fixed in new, but instead we optimize for our maximum likelihood at time 1, which is equivalent to optimizing KL divergence between our flow at time 1 and the distribution of new. 
as this KL divergence gets very small and the flow has become more and more equivalent. Uh, and this means that we converge to the Wasserstein flow or the Wasserstein dynamic uplink transport with this regularized CNF. Uh, for a more precise treatment of this, see the paper. For example, let's see uh, the CNF that maps a 2D Gaussian to this distribution that's uniform over the letter S. We show the paths over time of particles from red to blue using different optimization strategies. Without regularization, the continuous snarling flow takes reasonable paths, uh, but they are dictated by the implicit biases of the neural architecture and the optimization we use. Uh, but adding this squared L2 penalty to the flow function, also known as the energy penalty because it penalizes the energy of the paths, we recover the paths that are close to the optimal transport solutions. So this sort of shows how we are getting closer and closer to the dynamic couple transport and can use this to solve the same problem, just approximating the endpoints. So just to recap here, uh, we have this baseline trajectory net model that is a continuous modeling flow with an energy penalty which can be used in other applications where energy is minimized, but we will now show how to use it better for modeling cells. We have more information about cellular systems, which we do not in other systems, and we'll show how to build a more accurate model for this. Uh, first, a little bit about the data we use. Uh, so as an example set, data set, we take this Android body data set and uh, these are human embryonic stem cells that are collected over 27 days at five time points. These cells start as stem cells and form distinct groups of precursor cells, such as cardiac cells, blood cells, muscle cell, uh, all precursors. Uh, so we can see a differentiation here over time that's really compressed in these five time points. So what this data looks like is that uh, there's a static snapshot of the gene profiles. So a set of cells uh, each with a vector of counts over each time point. The time point here are shown on the right. And here the cells are around 5,000 per time point and the genes are around 20 to 30,000. Uh, and the genes are the same, but the cells are different. Uh, so there's some additional properties of cells that we can use in our optimization. Uh, these priors are useful because they can control our model uh, and bias it towards more reasonable solutions. So first, cells move, but they also grow and die, right? Uh, and they split, so which we can model sort of as a unbalanced transport problem. A little bit more on that later. Uh, second, cells don't travel in straight lines, but we notice that they really travel non-linearly along uh, sort of following other cells. So you sort of travel on this manifold. And a lot of the single cell literature uses dimensionality reduction methods that have utilized this and utilized the smoothness of the, their forms in the manifold space. Uh, and lastly, uh, sort of recent work based on RNA splicing shows how to measure the approximate change in transcriptome for these measured cells. Uh, this is now termed RNA velocity and gives an estimate of the direction of the cell at each measured time. So these priors can improve our model of the transcriptome and be efficiently encoded through loss functions of our continuous normalizing flow, or, you know, so we can add them to check them. To model cell growth and death, we use unbalanced transport, which allows for the creation and destruction of mass at some cost. It is difficult to learn the growth and death along with the flow, so we learn a separate model instead. We use a discrete optimal transport to estimate the growth and death rates for each cell and then learn a continuous model from that that is regularized by these values. This cell growth and death is necessary because often the picture on the right happens where, you know, some cells are growing and a group of cells is dying and we don't want to map the uh, dying cells to growing cells, right? This is not biologically possible. Cellular state space is very low dimensional. So what we've been showing all along is a scatter plot in two dimensions, but really right, these data points come in 30,000 dimensions. So how are we doing that? It's actually forming a graph based on the Euclidean distance between each cell. So this sort of shows, and, and this is dimensionality reduced uh, based on the manifold structure. So we create a graph and then embed the graph. The, so the lower dimensional structure, right? we can see when we do these visualizations, 
and it shows how cells grow and differentiate sort of along this very restricted, very smooth manifold uh, in this low dimensional space. So in order to sort of capture this prior, right, we know a lot of other things use this, you constrain the flow as much as possible to areas where there's density to avoid impossible paths. So this loss is a hinge penalty on the k nearest neighbors for some randomly interpolated time point t. So if you are really far away from your k nearest neighbors, you are beyond some radius h, then we ensure the path to go closer to this neighbor. For example, so this impossible path, right, you know, most of the time points that along it will be very far from its k nearest neighbors, and so we will gradually drag that trajectory towards the, the, uh, the rest of the data. And so this penalty sort of trades off, right, the energy efficiency from our previous, you know, uh, dynamic optical transport with a model that says, you know, you should flow all the data. Uh, so RNA velocity gives this arrow at each cell. Uh, that's generally annoying to visualize, so here we group and average the velocities. Uh, so RNA velocity estimates the direction of change for each cell. Um, depicted here on this plot, but it's very, very noisy. So we think it gives a good estimate of direction, but so far nobody's really been able to actually calculate the magnitude very well. So we choose to penalize the cosine distance between our predicted distribution of the change of f and the RNA velocity at all the data points. This means they match direction, but ignores the magnitude. So on a toy example that we construct, Here's, uh, here's what it looks like. So we have a sort of a 1D manifold with uh, three time points, although we train on time zero and time one. Uh, you have a gray distribution is optimal transport in 1D. So first we embed this 1D manifold into two dimensions along this tree structure, and then we create some velocity on it and uh, see what happens when we do a standard trajectory net and then add density regulation or velocity regulation. So in standard trajectory net, we are basically doing optimal transport, right? So the optimal transport along in the Quinian space is to just, you know, map each point as directly as possible. And you can see that on this first line. On the second line, you can see with the, the density regulation, um, points sort of stick close to other points. So even though there's less density, there's still a little bit of density between T0 and T1 in the middle. So it sort of maps along and also velocity regulation does even better because we're penalizing each cell the direction. Uh, so you can see sort of with density of velocity, this can help follow manifolds if we think it follows this structure. So using these penalties allows us to impute the density at any time point or track the likely ancestry or descendant transcriptomes of individual cells. Here visualized on the embryonic body data set. <coughs> You can see here the density sort of flowing over time following these paths. So to evaluate our model, we use the Washington distance between the predicted and ground truth distributions. Uh, for models where we leave one out, leave one time point out, we find the different regulations have different trade-offs based on the assumptions they make. For example, growth is the most difference across cells early, thus taking into account growth is most important when leaving out time point one. Well, when leaving at the second time point, density realization is especially important. So once we have a trajectory net model, we can trace back the ancestry of easily identified and well differentiated cells to find early markers of their divergence. This is important for understanding gene regulation and can potentially discover novel markers of development or disease. So just in summary, uh, through energy regulation, continuous normalizing flows can be modified to form dynamic optical transport to redo in trajectory. Then we take trajectory net, which takes this regularized continuous normalizing flow, and adds other penalties to give a plausible cellular trajectories according to our assumptions. We can then use these and interpolate individual trajectories or populations to understand the transcriptome space. So thanks for listening. Uh, please check out our code or our paper at the links on this slide. Uh, this project wouldn't have happened with numerous conversations with members of the Krishnaswamy lab. I'm extremely grateful and uh, funding from the NIH uh, Ivado and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, thanks again.